Hello, my name is Mark, and I thank you so much for coming by today. Well, we've all had those moments when we set up for a creative, immersive project, and we have all our tools ready, we have everything set up in our environment, we have our coffee or our tea, everything's ready to go, and we start the project feeling really positive, energized, and everything's moving and flowing just as we expected it to, until suddenly something happens and something goes wrong, a decision is made or a mistake happens and we lose control of the project and we feel that pang of panic and frustration and we have to make a decision on what to do next. And that decision is basically what will drive the future of your work or our work. And that decision could be something as simple as crumpling up the paper and starting again. It could be as simple as changing the page in a, a sketchbook. Or it could be as simple as just giving up altogether. Now, most of us can make a mistake or have a flaw in our piece that we won't walk away from it. But I've seen so many students who get frustrated when they can't draw something the way they want or it's not coming out the way they thought it was going to come out and they throw it away. They dismiss the piece altogether. And as I've said in other videos, one of the most important things is recognizing when we've made a mistake or we have a flaw and working with it, seeing the project through. Now this painting that you're seeing here, I drew this with Sharpies. Uh, I like the composition. It's just a fun painting. I'm using Sennelier paints to paint it in. But this is a non-committal painting, meaning I am allowing myself to make mistakes here because I'm trying some new things in this, this painting. So this is just for fun. I'm not expecting much, but I will say this, my ego is expecting this to be the perfect painting. Even though my brain is telling me, my, my intellect is saying, no, it's not going to be <laughs> a perfect painting because that's an unachievable goal. Perfection is virtually unattainable. We can look at the past masters like Picasso or Rembrandt or Georgia O'Keeffe, and we can see their work as being perfect because it looks so good. But I'm sure those artists would be able to pull out flaws in their own artwork or mistakes that they made and said, you know what, I, I should have done this differently or I wish I had done this differently. And they might have their own opinion on their own work. Well, I'm not at that level of, of being a creative person. I'm at my own level, which I, I feel like I'm good at what I do, but I'm certainly not great at what I do because I still make mistakes. I still have flaws that I need to overcome. They don't come out all the time in every piece, but when they do come out, I'm starting to recognize them more and more. And I say, okay, I need to step back off that, that thing that I'm doing and recognize my flaw and not keep doing it from piece to piece to piece. I need to recognize it and stop doing it. And one of those things for me, I know, is that I can sometimes be too heavy handed with my colors and I oversaturate certain areas. And uh, another thing is not measuring my values properly, not getting in the basic tones first and weighing out the colors and how heavy certain colors can be against others. That's another flaw that I have that I need to work on. But again, when that ego kicks in, Ego is what supports our confidence and our security and our positive energy. Because when we go into that immersive project, again, we're looking for perfection. Now, this piece is a little different because I'm trying something different here. You can see I'm starting to do this modeling technique. And modeling is basically painting with blotches to take different colors or different shades of, of one color and get a textural effect and to get sort of a depth within the character. And you can see it, it's like kind of a blotchy, splotchy effect on the character. And I'm gonna try that because that's something I used to do only with colored pencil, but I wanna start trying it with, color, uh, with watercolor. So it's an effect, uh, it's an effect that I can control, but is it something that I will work with in the future? I don't know, I'm gonna work with this painting, see if I like it, maybe try it again in another painting and see how that goes. So. Here I'm trying a new technique. Whenever we're trying something new, we can expect mistakes. We can expect those flaws. And that's just normal for the process. In this particular painting, and it'll come up later, I'll get to it, but when we make a mistake, in this painting, I'm gonna make a mistake here. And uh, you're gonna see it, I'm gonna explain it, it'll unfold right in front of you. But when we make a mistake, our ego doesn't want to acknowledge it. Our ego wants to just say, it's fine, just ignore it. 
Now, there's two different kinds of mistakes. There's the mistake when you accidentally swipe your hand across the page and smear your watercolor or your ink across the page and you ruin it. Uh, it's hard to recover from that kind of a mistake. It's, it's possible, but it's hard to recover from. The other kind of mistake is when we just aren't recognizing our flaws, meaning when our anatomy is incorrect or when our colors aren't working together because we don't understand color theory properly. So having those kind of flaws, well, that's when the ego kicks in and ignores those flaws and tells us that it's okay, it's fine, it's good, and keeps moving on. Unfortunately, when that happens is if the anatomy is off, it's going to keep showing up in our work over and over from piece to piece to piece. And we're going to keep making that same mistake, that same flaw will keep appearing in our work over and over, and we'll never learn from it and we'll never grow. Now, when we look at our own work, our ego is our worst critic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it's our, our worst critic in the sense that it's always going to feed the positive. It's all, our ego is always going to say, you know, yeah, I, I really like that. And it's important to celebrate our strengths. And just sitting down and being creative, that's a strength. It takes time and effort and energy and sometimes cost to, to buy the materials to sit down and immerse in a creative project. And so celebrating strengths is huge. But sometimes our ego celebrates falsely. And even though there's a flaw, a glaring flaw in our work, the ego sometimes just dismisses it and doesn't really worry about it. When someone looks at our piece and says, hey, that's a really good piece, but that anatomy is kind of just kind of funky. There's something funky with that hand or there's something funky with the eyes. That's when our ego takes a hit and that hit targets our insecurity. So now when somebody's pointed out a flaw and all of a sudden we panic, we go into that that mode of defensiveness and say, well, no, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm going to work on that. That's that's something I Yeah, OK, fine. And we get defensive. And <laughs> I know it happens to all of us. But over time, we can look at those flaws. And if we can take that criticism as constructive and learn from it and say, geez, you know, they're right. That that hand is way off or that uh, that eyeball looks really funny. So acknowledging our weaknesses and nurturing our weaknesses is just as important as celebrating our strengths. Now, with this painting, you know, I'm just here to have fun with it. It's simply just for practice. It's to keep my hand in shape and my, my muscle memory toned up so I can continue doing projects going forward. Every, you know, whenever I go into the next project, I want to be in shape for it. It's like anything. Practice, practice, practice makes you better. So even though I'm trying something new, a new technique, it's still practice. And I want to make sure I can see the flaws when they come out. So... Uh, as it's going right now, everything's going perfectly smooth. But I can say that, um, you know, I recently had an incident where I was making a soup. I was trying to mimic a Korean beef soup that I had at a restaurant. And uh, I talked to the chef and he said he used garlic, uh, lime juice and mint. And the mint kind of threw me off. I said, oh, geez, I didn't expect to hear that. So I went home and, uh, you know, a few weeks later, I decided to make that soup myself. And that was probably last week. So I made the soup and um, as I'm cooking, everything's going great. Like I said, everything, all my tools are out. My environment is set up, got some music playing, everything's going good. <laughs> and so I came to the mint and I washed it, cleaned it. And as I was chopping it up, I noticed it had kind of a funky smell. It kind of smelled a little bit like wet cat. And instinctively in my brain, I said, geez, that doesn't smell right. That smells kind of funky. I don't think I should use that. But because I was cooking and I was in the moment, I said, geez, I don't have time to make this decision and I don't have other mint to use. I just chopped it up and threw it into the stew. And so uh, <laughs> when it was done and I served it to my family, everybody kind of looked at it and said, mm, it's good. It's really good, but there's kind of a funny taste to it. I, I can't put my finger on it. Well, I knew what it was. I didn't say anything to anybody, but I knew exactly what it was. It was that mint. It had just such a funky taste to it that it didn't ruin the soup, but it definitely left a taste behind. And my family knew it. I knew it. I confessed. I said, yeah, I think it was that mint that I bought. It kind of smelled kind of funny and I wish I hadn't used it. 
But I did, and we ended up eating it for leftovers for the next few nights, and it was fine. But going forward, I now know if I'm going to use that, if I'm going to make that same dish again, make sure the mint that I get is fresh. Make sure the lime juice that I get is fresh. Don't use lemon juice, use lime juice, and make sure the mint is quality mint. So that's what I'll do going forward. And that applies to what we're doing here with any creative process. If we're, uh, if we're making a soup or painting a painting or even making an afghan, understand where the flaws are, understand where our mistakes were, and learn from those mistakes and nurture the weakness that we have if we don't know something. If I don't know my color theory and I don't know what colors will work with other colors, I need to learn more about that and I need to study it and practice it more because then going forward, I can eliminate that and my ego can be stronger, my confidence can be stronger, and I'll have a more positive enjoyment in the moment. And that's exactly what I want. That's what this is all about is embracing the enjoyment of the moment. And that's all we want to do as artists is enjoy the process of what we're doing. If it's frustrating and we keep running into the same mistakes or flaws, then we're not going to enjoy doing it. So what I'll show you here is this is uh, the beginning of the end for this piece. Uh, once I finish up this blue character here, I start working on the character to the left and I start creating a purple color. What I'm going to start using is uh, it's blue violet. Uh, it's a Sennelier blue violet color and it looks like lavender. It's a really nice color and uh, I, well, I, as you can see, it, it goes on nicely. It plays nice against the other colors and that's what I really enjoyed about it. And that's why I chose this in my palette because I wanted something that was going to play off the yellow in the background and even the, uh, the peachy yellowish orangey color of the far left character, the bottom left character. I wanted this color to play off those two elements. And right now it's doing it well and I'm really enjoying how it looks. However, once I painted in the hair, the color of the hair, it was monochromatic. So the whole character was one color. So I thought, hmm, I better add some, I think it's dioxidine purple to darken that up. But my mistake was it was too dark. And now the contrast is going to start playing off the other colors. And so I should have used just a very slightly darker version of that lavender color, that blue violet. Because now what I did was I made a bad decision. <laughs> it's not a bad decision per se, but I made a poor decision in adding that purple to the blue violet, making it darker. And you can see where the hair meets the skin of the character. It's now losing the contrast. The value is now changing. And where I had a nice value play among all the different characters, now this purple is becoming dominant. If I stopped right here, if I stopped right where I am, the project could keep going and there would be really no issue. However, my brain and my ego said, no, keep moving, keep making that hair darker and do something to make it pop more. Well, the next mistake I made was to add Prussian blue into that purple violet mix. And that's where, to me, that's where the problem kind of just exacerbated itself. And now all of a sudden I've got this Prussian blue on top of violet. I have the blue character on the right side now kind of playing off the, the purple character and it's not playing nicely together. So in my plan, the background character is Viridian green. Now the Viridian green was supposed to be laid down in a flat wash, kind of like the red character just to make them set back a little more. But because I did that purple so strong, I felt like the Viridian wasn't strong enough. So I started adding more green Viridian. Now the problem with that is green Viridian is made up of a, a blue and a yellow. The purple colors that I have are, are red and yellow. So now I've got this blue theme between both characters that are playing off the blue of the cerulean blue character and that far right green character. There's a lot of blue going on here and that's where my mistake was. If I had kept to that, that light blue violet color, that lavender color, everything would have been fine. But I had to go and make that decision and that was my flaw, was not listening to my instinct and saying stop when I needed to. So what happened was my ego got in the way. I, I said, no, it'll be fine, I'll just keep working it. But the more I worked it, all of a sudden, my confidence started going down. 
my insecurity started going up. I started having that panicky fear that I'm going to lose control of this piece. And the next thing I know, I lost the piece. It, it went out of control. Now you can see here, you might look at this and say, I don't know what he's talking about. Everything looks fine to me. But if you really analyze it and look at it, you can see that there's flaws. It's a, it's a color value flaw. And that's something that usually comes through when you uh, plan it out. If you create a, a swatch palette first, you can control your colors based on that. And I went against my own palette and I added that Prussian blue and that's when I lost the piece. So I can fix it digitally, I can, I can adjust it, but overall, I think it's just going to be there. And if this was a final piece, I would probably redo it. If it, if it were a piece that I was selling to a client or a customer or something, I would probably redo this and do it better. So the most important thing is to recognize those weaknesses, especially when the ego is telling you to do one thing and you know better and nurture that weakness. Always celebrate the strengths. Again, the first strength we have is sitting down and creating in the first place but also the strengths of knowing our color theory, knowing our anatomy and all those things. Identify the flaws and take notes. Write notes on the back of the painting if you need to. That's what I do sometimes and I will for this piece. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to embrace the enjoyment of the moment of your creative experience. Have a great time painting. I hope this was enjoyable for you. Thank you for coming by and as always, God bless.